So it, it leads us into one of the important points, Jennifer, with regards to the virus evolution. And this is something that you had shared. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Okay, certainly. So um, viruses evolve based on Darwinian principles. So we know this is basic biological methods for evolution. Um, and there are three premises. One is genetic variation and adaptation. Two would be natural selection, and the third is survival of fitness. Fittest. So, um, when, and I love talking about this from the virus point of view as a virologist, it gets me excited. So, um, when you look at viruses, okay, the whole goal of a virus is to just propagate, to make more of itself. I'm the best thing ever. I'm going to make millions of copies. I'm going to spread all over the place. It's going to be great um, because I'm just I'm just that amazing. So viruses, that's all they want to do. They just want to make more of themselves. So um, the the benefit of of going to new host is that they can spread more widely. Right. But upon first interaction with a new host, a virus, um, a virus may cause severe disease. So then they have a dead end host and that also takes them out of the game. So a virus is, doesn't want to kill a host. A virus wants to keep their host alive and actually it benefits a virus to infect young healthy people because they're out and about, they're social, they're uh, you know out with all kinds of other people mixing. So it gives this virus, the virus an advantage to spread. So I like to say, like, let's look at Ebola, you know, kill, kill the kill rate up to 90 percent um, mortality. So it's not a very smart virus. It doesn't spread easily. Um, it kills its host pretty rapidly. It doesn't get to spread. Um, and we look at a virus like influenza. I like to say influenza graduated college. So influenza learned. Um, let's look at a comparison. 1918 H1N1 virus, because, you know, influenza is actually a disease of birds. Um, established stable lineages in humans. And in 1918, an H1N1 virus um, infected humans. And look what happened. We had a pandemic, killed um, estimates range from 50 to 100 million people worldwide. Um, so high or low morbidity, high mortality. So the virus spread, but it killed a lot of people um, and it died out eventually. Um, and then we come to 2009, we had again H1N1, which was similar to 1918. Um, high morbidity, low mortality. So the virus was able to transmit widely from person to person, cause very little mortality. So it learned over the course of time um, how to, or co-evolved, I should say, with the host um, for a mutually benefit relation, beneficial relationship. So over time, viruses that are well adapted to the host will cause little or no disease, right? So that's the adaptation part. Now, um, when we look at uh, what are the drivers of mutations, like what, what makes a virus, what puts selection pressure on a virus, okay? And I, I came up with three things. One would be evasion of host defenses, so skirting the immune response. Second would be escape from antiviral drugs. And then third, of course, circumvention of vaccine immunity. So let's look at SARS, right? So SARS uh, entered the population um, and there's a caveat I'll, I'll explain later, but when the virus first entered the population, it was mostly a naive population, right? This is a, a new strain of coronavirus that um, people didn't really have immunity to. So the virus was really spreading rapidly and uncontrolled. So it had high um, morbidity high mortality, right? We were seeing a lot of deaths, but it was able to spread from person to person relatively easy. Now, because there was little to no pre-existing immunity, the virus had very little selection pressure. So the virus um, didn't really mutate or produce variants within the first 10 months of the pandemic. So between uh, when it first emerged in December 2019, um, till October of 2020, when we saw the, the first variants start to emerge. Now, um, coronaviruses in general, they're very large RNA viruses. So the genome's almost 30,000 base pairs. It's very large. It takes a lot longer to replicate than something like influenza. It also has a lower mutation rate. Why is that? 
Well, <clears throat> most RNA viruses mutate heavily because they don't have a proofreading uh, program. So like influenza, it replicates and makes a lot of mistakes. Um, it can't correct those. It's like on a typewriter. Back in the day when I was in high school, we learned on a typewriter and you had to use the, the whiteout to correct your mistakes. Influenza makes a lot of mistakes. So it's about one in every thousand to one in every 10,000 um, base pairs, there'll be a mistake. With coronavirus, it's even, it's even larger than that. So they're very, it's a very stable uh, genome actually. Again, without selection pressure, it has no reason to adapt. There's no reason to, to uh, change. Um, and also when we think about mutations, we have to think about where the mutations occur. That's very important. And I said early on that if the mutations are not occurring in key antigenic sites, those are the sites where antibodies can bind, or in the receptor binding domain, then it doesn't really matter. And I know it's a very simplistic, it's very simplistic because there are other um, issues with other viral proteins, but in general, the receptor binding domain and antigenic sites are where you wanna be concerned for uh, mutations. Now, this virus was very well adapted to the host receptor. It bound the ACE2 lock and key. So my professional opinion is any, uh, any mutations in the receptor binding domain would be maladaptive. Why would the virus want to change if it's already binding very well to its host receptor? Okay, so <clears throat> then, um, then we introduced the, the vaccine. And I know this hopefully doesn't get us in trouble, but... Um, for people to say that vaccines are, do not cause drift variants is very naive, and it's ignoring a whole body of literature on viral evolution, because we know that pushing, especially non-neutralizing antibodies onto a virus, is going to cause this virus to um, change so that it can continue to spread well. So we know, and I said this on LinkedIn, which is one thing I got in trouble for, but... Um, they said, well, these variants came out before the vaccine campaign um, started in December 2020. But if you look at where these vaccines were first tested, the countries where they were first tested, and if you look at where these variants first emerged, so Brazil, in Brazil, India, Brazil in Africa, India, UK, um, and South Africa, I mean, it's, it's highly coincidental, I think, that and if you look at Omicron specifically, Omicron we know came from those who were fully vaccinated, right? So you can't deny that that, that uh, variant emerged from a fully vaccinated person. So the immune pressure was there. Now, I guess uh, one of the benefits of this vaccination campaign was that it accelerated the viral evolution so that we now have a more attenuated viral variant, right? So Omicron is not causing a very high mortality, right? So it's high morbidity, low mortality. So now we have the more attenuated strain. So I guess that, I guess we can say that's one benefit. <laughs>